welcome everyone. Great to see everybody. We've got a fantastic crowd tonight. Absolutely delighted to have uh, Susan Mycellus here, uh, my friend and colleague in Magnum. So needless to say, it's a total pleasure. And, you know, of course, we wish we were all together somewhere in some space, but it's kind of the Zoom life that we're living. Um, I just wanted to say this is, it, this is, you know, a great invitation. It's the first time I'm talking about these two books and I call them my COVID babies. And I know that may seem odd. Um, they, they both came, they came to be because I had to stay still, frankly. So, you know, here we are. Um, they both did involve a kind of collaborative and a collective process. And I, what I thought I'd just do is walk you through some stages of that. So just to jump in, I'm, I'm uh, you know, each of these books had a different path, but they really do both start in a, surprisingly, I realize now, in 1974, when I first moved to Little Italy. So that building on the left, that's not a, that's a historical photograph, that kind of funky roof. Note was slanted. So of course, I never imagined people were making photographs on roofs then. Um, but I started teaching photography in a classroom in the South Bronx and at the same time. So 1974, I'm moving to Little Italy and the picture on the right is where I first meet a group of girls who call themselves the Prince Street Girls because they were limited to stay on the corner of Prince and Mott Street at that time. And they were uh, coming right out of the Catholic school on the corner, the opposite corner. So, you know, that's that, that's sort of where, they, where the work begins for me in my neighborhood, a group, they called themselves the Prince Street Girls and they became, they had been, it turns out, Prince Street Girls long before them in Virginia. My neighbor told me she was a Prince Street Girl before this generation. But these are photographs I'm making at that time in the early mid seventies, um, following them, crossing paths with them after school on the weekends. Nothing was planned, lots of incidental encounters and just watching them become the women they have become. Um, I just brought in a couple of pictures to note that the church, of course, St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is in, right in front of my home is also was the center of the community and their lives as well. So whether it was communions, uh, this is Julia on the left and Lisa on the right. And just so you see, you know, there she is on, in the, on the right of both of those frames, married and, and now with two children, um, aged 50 plus. So I was capturing them in this early stage of their transformation. And it took actually about 40 years before I put the pictures into a very small catalog when I did the first show in 2000. Some, somewhere around 2015, 16. And simultaneously, I learned that the Basilica of St. Patrick's was planning to have a celebration for the 200th anniversary. And so along with the Monsignor who was in charge of the um, community, the church community and a group of neighbors, we start to think about a way to bring the photographs of the past to welcome people into the community. So this is just the, a flyer inviting people to come with their photographs um, and to contribute in whatever way they chose. And one of the first, one of the pictures, there's Virginia on the right and Lewis, Angel's husband, telling a story about a picture he's brought. We were scanning the pictures, giving them back scans and also small prints when they came in. And of course, finding out who were in the pictures, etc. And it was really in this moment that I began to, to imagine or see photographs that for the most part were very church related, um, but they were also in the church or they were on the street around the church. And the exceptions were a couple of pictures that came in about from the rooftops. So that's sort of at the time we we're collecting. I mean, of course we have no idea who's gonna come to this Saturday scanning session or what people might have or what they might bring or if they would be even willing to contribute them to this project. Um, and I think the, I started to imagine the only way I could see that yellow square sort of surrounds the book is the block on Mulberry and Mott Street, Houston and Prince, which is the, the church is right in the center of it. And we started to scout around to all the storefronts, um, imagining maybe they would choose a photograph to place in their storefront. And that would give people who came to visit the church on that special weekend a sense of the history of the community. 
So the idea was that they would choose a picture, a historical picture and place it in their, their shop windows. Um, so this was a local pizzeria, their design and fashion show the stores. Many of these have actually are absent now and were boarded up um, in the last months of COVID. Um, but Cafital, which was the place we scanned, you know, celebrated with a number of images on their windows. And, and uh, this is a fashion designer, Maggie Francis, very small storefront boutiques. Um, the public library has a branch on Mulberry Street just behind the church. So they were fantastic, not only putting pictures in the storefront, but then inviting seven of the Italian American writers from the community to do a special reading called Fact and Fiction, which was this part of this long, wonderful weekend. Anyway, that, that was 2015. And then, you know, again, as things happen, as we all know, things sit around and there were lots of pictures sitting in a corner in my studio amongst the piles of many other things. So even though I had this idea of having seen a few of these rooftop images, I couldn't quite get it together to, to kind, of, kind of prioritize the time and moving around so much, it wasn't really until COVID that we reactivated the project. And, and this is Virginia handing off a photograph that she's just found. So you can see where COVID, you know, plastic gloves, whereas Angel didn't come down to the street, but literally would drop a plastic bag out of her window full of photographs that somebody, a neighbor had given her, or I would go around the corner, ring a bell. So it, it just began in the COVID time that we were all in the neighborhood, though we weren't able to intersect very often. And we also started this virtual collection process, which would be that, you know, Virginia would talk to one of her, either it would be a cousin or a friend or a family member, and they would send via their iPhones pictures that they kind of had, in some cases, were making just images of, not necessarily digitized scans. And one of the kind of wonderful moments was because both Angel and Virginia uh, knew Marty Scorsese who grew up on Elizabeth Street, which was just the parallel street to Mott on the other side of Mulberry, of Mott, uh, not on the Mulberry side. And it turned out that he had family photographs that he was willing to contribute. So this is the Scorsese family. And that of course led to a very um, kind of amazing contribution that, that Marty Scorsese was willing to write the introduction, which was a great celebration for us. And, you know, I just thought I'd read just one little phrase of what he writes, but to give you a feeling, um, this is also, uh, you can see Yo Cuomo, I'm gonna introduce her in a minute, Jess Ball, who works with me and, um, and Bonnie Richardson and Bobby and Yo and I began to design the book on Zoom. So I'll get to that in a minute, but just to read a little of Marty. Uh, and this is really a short quote. He has a, um, the roof was our escape hatch and it was our sanctuary. You would walk up that flight of stairs, open the door and you were above it all. You could breathe, you could dream, you could be. So that was kind of the perfect, perfect introduction to this set of photographs. So here we are and, um, you know, Yo, I don't know if you always had been designing other books by Zoom. It was really challenging, though we all had this tool of issue, which meant that we could, you know, revisit, revisit, revisit sequences digitally. And um, that was a kind of comparing, comparing photographs uh, and trying to figure out um, the sequence was the most challenging probably, but that tool uh, would made it quite, quite fluid. Even the, even the process of color correction and reviewing, you know, the scans coming back, the pages coming back, all the production stages, I was astounded how much we were able to do uh, on Zoom. So just, just walking along, um, this was an interesting decision. And I think when you're working both collectively and, and you know, this was a big decision the, there were, when we came to the question of the, the um, cover of the book, um, it was, it was uh, we love the photograph on the left, um, but the picture on the right was Angel's mother Tootsie. And so it meant a lot to all of us, I think, that Tootsie was on the cover of this book. So I just want you to know that that, you know, Sometimes a photograph is not just this object, but it's the connection to community. It's the connection to the people who are in the photographs that make it so much more important to acknowledge um, their, 
you know, the significance of those kinds of choices. So we, we chose the picture on the right. And just to give you a sense again of what for me is extraordinary that when we talk about you know, what kinds of collaboration are possible. The fact that Angel shared her picture from herself at age two on the left in this beautiful, precious frame. And there she is age 18, dancing to Up on the Roof by Carol King. Um, you know, it's a, she has so many more that probably she wished were in the book, but of course we were limited by pages. And so just to end this little chapter about Tar Beach, there we are, we had one book signing at Dashwood and we had one, Angel's on the left, Virginia's on the right. And we had one um, book signing in the community garden in the neighborhood, but of course with COVID, everything's locked, we're all in lockdown. So the big disappointment I think for all of us is that we haven't had the full celebration in the community that we would have hoped for and hopefully we'll still dream, dream to have to make happen someday in the, if there's still books in the future. Anyway, I'm gonna jump into the other book which has a different kind of history. This is Eyes Open and um, you know, it also has very deep roots for me and I'm gonna give you a sense of that process. Um, as I said, I began teaching in the South Bronx and of course when we, this is 1973, uh, 74, 75 and I'm, making photographs, both building a dark room in a fourth, fifth and sixth grade classroom. Sometimes we're working with small plastic cameras. We also work with pinhole cameras made out of shoe boxes. And then of course, the amazing thing was that Polaroid Foundation became very generous and interested in providing educators cameras and film. So I was in this classroom thinking about how do you use photography to engage kids with the world surrounding them mostly focused on their need to write and to read their, maybe if they read their own words, they would learn to read. So writing and reading and engaged in the community was kind of the focus of the teaching that I was doing at that time. And when Polaroid offered to give us cameras, I kind of wrote back to them and said, yeah, but what are people doing with the cameras? Because, you know, I had my own limited ideas. Um, we didn't yet have, I had not gone and been trained in photography. I, I just begun doing photography myself through being in the classroom. And then as I showed you uh, on my own streets. Um, so the, what was interesting about Polaroid is that they, you know, this instant image changed in a way what the possibilities were for the classroom and to be much more inclusive to more kinds of classrooms. And what I ended up doing was writing about a hundred teachers who had received the cameras and film from Polaroid and asked them, what were their best ideas? What did they do? What were, you know, what were the lessons? What were the connections that they were trying to draw out from kids? And that's what led to this source book of ideas. It was called Learn to See, which was a title I hated, but I was stuck with. And essentially these, this is just a couple of their spreads to give you a sense of the orientation. I love this project on the left. And it was, you can see there are these little finger puppets and this teacher had figured out to, to encourage young students, these are 10 year olds probably, to do role play between their siblings or their parents and, their, and the kids. Um, this was, I just thought genius. And so they would cut up the Polaroids and paste them on, on gloves. Uh, and make finger puppets. And there were others that came up with other kinds of ideas like how to teach math off of a photograph. You know, how can a kid learn square roots? This would probably have been for a fifth or a sixth grade classroom. The, the project on the right was a wonderful teacher who thought about making photographs of objects and it was like a scavenger hunt and the kids would have to find the objects she listed and then make a photograph and then tell a story, write a story that connected those three photographs. So again, you know, disparate objects, totally wonderful way to engage kids with thinking about how to kind of not just make the photograph, but what else can the photograph elicit or inspire. And so uh, one of my earliest projects in, had been this project called Alphabetography. And of course, you know, 
how do you get kids to think, to focus, to frame? Um, when Denise Wolfen from Aperture approached me a number of years ago, having seen Learn to See, you know, the question was, it didn't seem appropriate anymore to do a facsimile of this book, but the question is, what could we be, what could we do that would be different within the world of digital world today that, um, that reflected what other kinds of possibilities. So this is what Eyes Open is drawn from. Um, we did include alphabetography as the first in a kind of project-based book of 23 projects. Um, we mimicked a bit my process by reaching out to about 200 teachers globally and saw the images from roughly 400 kids. And so that's something I could never have done 45 years ago. We sent out some of the old spreads from Learn to See and then hoped that they would be there as reference and that other teachers and students would, would ad lib and expand the approaches and the ideas to have you know, more contemporary and complementary prompts. So alphabetography led me to also think about how photography was no longer constrained in a classroom. And as we all know, it's everywhere. So thinking about where kids are seeing images or imagining with artists, what has drawn them to create and expand a visual vocabulary themselves and visual language really. So we began to then intersect the student work with artists who kind of touched on and hopefully would continue to inspire the kids to go beyond what they had contributed. So there are prompts and then there are responses by students and then their associative work by artists. And this just gives you a sense, again, we're on Zoom trying to put this project together last spring. Endless database of images coming in, how to possible, what do they speak to? Uh, and the, what you see to the right is those texts where we're researching, trying to find quotes from the artists that would also expand the reflection and some questions, provocations to expand creative process for kids. So again, in the end, we have the work of 51 students, 33 artists from 18 countries. And that's kind of amazing about, I don't think we could have done it without Zoom um, quite as efficiently. So just another sense, we're, we're looking at student work. Um, we're evolving projects, figuring out how do you get from the alphabet to the issues of light and movement or beyond the prompt of a selfie to something more like observe your family, in this case, just being themselves. You know, can you capture them when they're not posing or thinking about how they look for the camera? Trying to bring kids into different ways of thinking about photography. And then including someone like Yel Martinez from Mexico who writes, you know, that he decides not to travel to the other side of the world, but instead portray his own family and community. And he says he's showing the aspects that go unseen. So, you know, trying to bring kids into thinking that others have done and continue to do around them. You know, and of course, most kids other than the selfie are thinking about me, but what is beyond the me, the photograph of the me that is the selfie? So this idea, can you share a story about yourself that goes with and beyond what the picture shows? So trying to again, build a progression from family to people I know is another project to the notion of me. There's this progression in the book. Um, these are some of the um, immigrant kids who contributed from Queens outside of New York. And the artists we chose, two different artists. And sometimes there's one, sometimes there are two, sometimes one student, sometimes two. Uh, this is obviously Jim Goldberg, many of you would know, Rich and Poor, which was such a seminal project, so important, um, raising the question of who tells the story. And, as, and he also makes the point that a lot of photographs are taken from the outside looking in. So just for, for that kind of reflection and then a very different kind of um, sequence which leads to Wendy Redstar writing on images of her Crow ancestors, historical photographs from the archive that um, her elders know things and she wants to note what they want to pass on about in reflection on looking at those photographs. So she's passed, she's really making photographs to pass on to the next generation, the history of her own people. 
just another kind of example. This is the 23rd project and I, I kind of feel it was the, one of the most wonderful surprises. This is coming from the Cree Nation in Canada where they were stitching into the landscape um, and threading uh, what they felt was missing in the landscape. And that just seemed like such a beautiful idea to end in that you go from whatever the real that you're facing to the imagined that you're dreaming. Um, we end with Clarissa Sling, Sling Sly, I think is how she pronounced it, who returns um, us to memory and, you know, saying when we look around us, the past appears to be invisible, but it's always present. And so I guess in a funny way, that's that's the core of the book, just jumping, leaping through it a little bit. And again, this question of how, when you're making something, we do enclose this history that I shared with you earlier. It's a reference in the back of the book, nothing more than that to this, just why it is that I'm making this book, kind of my connection 45 years roughly or more uh, after I was doing the kind of teaching then that I, of course, am not teaching 10 year olds today. And the great struggle of making the book was that I wasn't around too many 10 year olds. And so that was the hardest part of making something that then couldn't be physically engaged with as an object, even though the Zoom made facilitated it. And Emma Chichuti knows that I called her in desperation. I said, isn't your daughter 10? What if she looked at this PDF? Which is hardly the same thing. But you know, that was a kind of outreach to, to readers to make to see if this was going to make any sense and at what age level we were we were touching um, the community of young image makers. So in a way, when I when I think about the project, it is a sort of circle of return for me too. Oh, so much has changed, you know, from the analog to our digital world. It's been transformed. Photography's been transformed. You know, and I can only hope that the the book is a kind of open invitation to kids of whatever age, you know, not necessarily in classrooms, but wherever they might find such a book, um, you know, to engage, to feel they can participate, they can question, and hopefully they can also consider the inherent collaborative nature of, of the art of the act of making an image or the making of even books of images. And I'm just going to end with this because it's sort of the final debate was do we or don't we include a cell phone or a camera? And so the design, I just thought it would be fun to show you that this was serious. This, this was a tough one, you know. Do, do people need to see that there's a camera to know that Eyes Open is about photography projects? Or is there a deeper just eyes open message that we wanna share? And in the end, we felt we didn't need the camera or the iPhone. And that seeing begins with, you know, out of the necessity, not just an image, but seeing, you know, is choosing to have eyes open. So that's kind of a whirlwind tour. Thank you very much for coming on. It's been really interesting, been a fantastic insight. So thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for thanks your support. Everyone. And um, thanks, good night. You all. Thanks everyone. Thanks for the invitation, Martin. <laughs>